So today we abort this beautiful topic of pseudorandom functions, one of the first of the many interesting concepts and definitions we meet in cryptography. So let's recall the motivation. We studied block ciphers and measured the security by key recovery, meaning security meant it's hard for an adversary to be able to recover a key given some input-output examples under that key. But then we saw that this wasn't good enough as a metric because it was easy to design ciphers that satisfied key recovery security, yet were blatantly insecure from the point of view of usage for encryption. And that led us to question the metric and led us to ask, well, what then is a definition of what is a good block cipher? What does good actually mean in such a way that we can be sure that when that definition of good is met, when we start employing the block cipher in usage and applications, things will work and be secure. We realize that this is not that easy. If you try to think of good as a list of different properties, it doesn't work because somehow that list, if finite, is always omitting something you actually want and you can't really deal with an infinite list either. So we're looking for really a different approach. We're going to obtain this by analogy. When Alan Turing set out to uh, pioneer the field of artificial intelligence, one of the things he asked himself is if we are on a quest to design programs that are intelligent, what does it mean actually for it to be intelligent? The understanding was that it should be kind of like a human being, but that's a rather difficult thing to, to capture because human beings have so many attributes and how does one even define what it means for a program to be like a person? Think of all the different capabilities and even limitations that human beings have. And is the program something that mimics some of them, all of them? So is there an interesting good answer to what it means to be intelligent in the sense of a human? And Turing came up with something called the Turing test. And this was a different paradigm. It didn't write down a property, but set it up as a, as a test in which some entity is trying to distinguish the input-output behavior of the program that purports to be intelligent and the human. And the extent to which the program is intelligent is the extent to which this distinguisher is unable to tell the difference. So you've probably seen this, but if you haven't, it works this way. You have, on the one hand, your program P. You're trying to measure how well it does at mimicking human behavior. The way you measure that is you create you have a room in which there is a keyboard and um, the keyboard simply faces a wall and at the other end it's connected to this program you have another room in which the setup is the same except that the other end it's the keyboard is connected at the other end of the wall to another keyboard at which is sitting a human who's going to type in the front of the room, you have a tester. It's going to enter things on the keyboard and get back responses. And from these responses, it's going to try to determine which room it's in, meaning, am I in the first room where my answers are coming from the program or in the second one where they're coming from the human? So we let the tester interact uh, with both parties. We put it in each room, one after the other. Of course, we don't let it see the number on the door. And then it comes out and we ask the tester, which room were, were you in? Which was which? And the more intelligent P is, the more uh, the tester will be unable to answer that. If the tester fails to correctly determine which room is which, we'll declare P to be intelligent. So that's the paradigm. We're going to now try to employ this with regard to 
the objects we're interested in. And here that's a block cipher. This leads us to look at the Turing intelligent test a little more abstractly and see it what it's trying to do. What you can think of is that it has something which is the real object, here a program, and it's measuring something about it, some notion, let's say intelligence, and is doing that by comparison with something that's presumed or um, viewed as having that property and that we call that the ideal object and in that case this was a human. So now for us the object, the real object is a block cipher. We're going to prescribe a certain notion which we call pseudorandom uh, function security and we have to ask here what is the ideal object we understand that we're going to set this up by some kind of distinguishing paradigm, but what are you supposed to mimic when you design a block cipher that is the ideal version of that block cipher? The answer is something called a random function. And perhaps at first it seems a little strange because this is just a kind of noise box and has no structure and you would think is that what we want cryptography to be and curiously enough the best tool for, for cryptography is indeed that kind of object. So we're going to begin now by just thinking about random functions. So for the moment block ciphers and so forth are not entering and we're going to pursue this through games. So consider a game called RAND. It's parameterized and associated to a set a finite set R called the range. It exports just one procedure, we'll call that Fn, and that procedure takes an input x which uh, it processes as follows. It simply picks a random point from the range and returns that. Every time you make a query x, the game responds or this procedure responds in a very, very simple way. It just returns a freshly chosen random number. Okay, but there's a little bit of structure and that structure is simply that if you twice ask the same x, it will not give you two different answers, but it will remember, oh, I saw this x before, I'm just going to give back the same answer that I gave before. And in this way, it creates a function from x to some output range. We can code it up as follows. Think of the game as creating a table t, initially everywhere undefined, which means t of x is this symbol bot for every x. As entries are added to the table, table and uh, starts start getting filled and things become non-bot. When you get a query x, test if it was already queried. If so, this will not be bot. And in that case, you return what's there. If it is bought, fill it with a random point and return that. Now, to make this simple, you may as well imagine that the x being queried here is not repeated because there's no value to anyone to repeat it. They just get back the same thing as before. Okay, we will have this game played with an adversary. It will make queries to Fn, get back answers, and then maybe output something and we are interested in the distribution of this output. So this output could be let's say just a bit but that bit will take on value 0 and 1 to different probabilities because after all there's a lot of randomness involved in here. So this will denote the probability that when I run the game with this range set and this adversary A, the output is D and that will be some number between 0 and 1. Let's make sure we understand that definition. So here I've written the RAND game again, except the set R has been fixed to the set of 3-bit strings. So how does the game work? Just as before, it's just that the table entries and what's being returned are chosen at random from the set of 3-bit strings. You could consider a whole slew of adversaries playing this game and outputting all kinds of stuff. 
but I picked a specific one. It happens to call the FN Oracle on input 0, 1 and get back something which it denotes as Y. It tests if Y is the string of all zeros, three zeros. If so, it returns true as false. Remember, this just means the Boolean. So now I would be interested in the probability that this game run with this adversary returns true and I want to compute it. So think about it a little bit and you should realize that that value is 1 8, 1 and 2 to the 3. Why is that? You're getting back a random 3-bit string here and that random 3-bit string has 1 and 8 chance to be 0, 0, 0. And that's it. That's how these things work. This example is a little more complicated. The game is the same, but our adversary now makes two queries, input 0, 0 and input 1, 1. So it gets back two things. And it wants to know whether the first has this value and the second has this value. If so, it concludes true, returns true, otherwise it returns false. Now, what is the probability that the game with this adversary returns true? Well, y1 is a random 3-bit string, so there's a 1 in 8 chance that this holds. y2 is a random 3-bit string that's chosen here independently of y1. So there's an independent uh, 1 8 probability that this is true. Multiply those two get together and you get 1 in 2 to the 3 times 1 in 2 to the 3 is 1 in 2 to the 6. Right? So it's quite easy to make computations of this form. Let's just do one more, which is actually quite common in analyses and a little bit more involved. Game is the same. Again, the adversary makes two queries, first on input 0, 0, then input 1, 1 to get back two answers. And we know now that these will be randomly distributed and independently distributed 3-bit strings. What it tests is whether the XOR is 1, 0, 1. So what's the probability the game returns true, meaning this condition is met? It's a little exercise in probability. It's just asking if I pick two strings at random, three bits long, what is the probability that that XOR is 101? That's all we're saying. And you can play around a little with the probability and you see that it's 1 and 2 to the 3. There are many ways to see that. One is that if you fix Y1, there's only one choice of Y2 that works. So if for any choice of Y1, there's a 1 and 2 to the 3 probability that you pick the correct Y2. And so as you sum over all the y1s, you, you get 1 and 2 to 3. But there are many other ways to see it. OK, so now remember what we're after is to use those random functions as the ideal objects and define security of a block cipher by their proximity to those objects as measured by some entity we'll call a distinguisher. It turns out that this definition, although right now our motivation is block ciphers, is a lot more general. So we'll just pause for a moment to uh, make that aspect uh, clear and reflected in what we do. So remember that a family of functions or a function family is a two input function. It takes a key and some point in an input space and returns an output in an output space. And remember that for every choice of key, when we subscript f with that key, we're talking about the induced function from the input space to the output space, which is defined as f uh, using this fixed key k here and the given input x here. A block cipher is simply a specific example of a function family which has a bunch of extra properties relating to this being a permutation. For example, des is created by picking a particular key space, particular domain and range, and insisting on uh, uh, the function itself actually being DES, and so forth. So um, our definition, in fact, will be uh, applied to, to function families. So now, in a nutshell, we will take a specific function family. This is our target, and we are interested in measuring how well it does with regard to a property we'll call PRF, or pseudo-random function security. And 
what we're going to be asking is that suppose we take a key k for this function family from the key set. We pick it at random, but then we freeze it and we give the tester access to f sub k. It can query this function with an input and get an output, but it doesn't see the key k. Do these input outputs look as if they came from a random function? If they do, then f is behaving well from the PRF perspective. If they don't, it's not. And that's what the, the definition is going to ask. So um, when we make this formal, we do it via these games. When we define key recovery security, there was a key recovery game. When we define PRF security, there are actually two games. The setup is that we start as, again by fixing a function family f. Remember, this is public. Everybody knows the description. Everybody knows exactly how it works. Imagine you have code for it. And if you want to be concrete, imagine that f here is DES or AES or something like that. Or make up some really simple example of your own. The first game is called real and it's parameterized by the function family. Initialize Pixar at random a key from this space and then freezes it inside the game. Importantly, it's not passed along to the adversary. The game knows it, the adversary doesn't. Only one procedure is exported and it's called Fn. The adversary can provide an input x, which is required to be in this input space. And what does the game return? It just evaluates the function family f with this key and this input. And whatever it gets goes back to the adversary. So in other words, by calling this oracle, the adversary is simply obtaining outputs of f sub k on inputs of its choice. It can call this many times. In all of those calls, the key k is the same. That won't change. The other game is our friend the random game with the range set being the, ray, the set of outputs of the function family. It has a procedure of the same name fn, which also takes an input x from this input space d. But what it does is it just implements the random game. In other words, it'll return a random value from the range set, unless, of course, you called it before on x, in which case it'll return the same value as before. Now we have an adversary a. What does it do? It can play this game. It will make queries to fn. It'll get back values. And we ask it then to output a bit. The same adversary can be executed in this game because the interface has the same name. So it could you can run it, the same adversary, with either game. Of course, it'll get back different answers. but uh, And that might change what it queries and what it outputs, but you can still execute them. What is this adversary trying to do? It's trying to tell which game it's playing. It's trying to say from, whether from the answers it gets back to its queries, it can determine whether things are happening this way or this way. We think of the adversary as outputting a one if it thinks it's playing this game and a zero if it thinks it's playing this game. Now, what we're interested in is the probability that it outputs a 1, which is the probability that it says, I think I'm playing the real game. You can measure that once you've fixed an adversary and you, of course, have already fixed this game. There is some such probability. It's a number and we'll usually, usually be able to compute it. Now, completely separately, you run the adversary again with this other game. Again, there'll be some probability it outputs 1, some number you you computed. Now, it's not the actual magnitude of these numbers that matters. If this 1 is a vote for here and a 0 is a vote for here, what we're interested in is how well does the adversary do at telling these apart? It does better if it returns 1 mostly here and 0 mostly here. In other words, 1 mostly here and 1 very seldom here. So to capture that, what we look at is the difference, the difference between the probability it returns one in the real world and the probability it returns one in the random world. And we call that its advantage. 
the advantage of the adversaries is parameterized by the function family f because that's the object with security we're measuring and it shows up here by the adversary itself the superscript is just the name of the metric so the random function and you obtain it by obtaining, getting these two properties and subtracting them the adversary knows f and will use that as in in determining its strategy which will be to make this number as large as possible okay now this definition is kind of central not just for itself but because we'll see many others of this form and it can take a while if you've never seen things like this before to kind of assimilate it and get used to it so um, you might find yourself coming back to it but this is the, the place where there's a lot of understanding needed and insight to be gathered and it takes a bit of time to do that so be prepared to put some in okay so the interpretation of the adversary's output as we saw is that it's trying to output a one in the real game and zero in the random game and we'll think of a prf advantage that's large which means close to one as meaning the adversary is doing well if your adversary is doing well you're kind of getting an indication that the function family f is not prf secure because the adversary is doing a good job determining which game it's playing or which world it's in if the prf advantage is close to zero then the adversary is basically saying i can't tell i don't know which um, uh, game i'm playing it's outputting one just about as often when it's true which is when it's in the real game as when it's not true which is when it's when it's in the random game so um, at that point we view f not yet quite as secure but at least as resisting the particular attack that a is mounting the difficulty is that maybe some other attack would do well but we'll have to get to that later now one little technicality here is what do we do if the advantage is negative and just as a matter of convention i will view that as also doing poorly you can always turn a negative advantage into a positive one by flipping the adversary's output bit so effectively a negative advantage translates to an attack but it's easier to somehow set things up so that we rarely or never have to actually deal with these negative things so far we've only seen what it means uh, to compute an advantage for a specific adversary and interpret it but what we're really interested in is is this function family secure so and that should mean that no matter what the adversary does it doesn't do too well but we already know from from our study of block ciphers that there are many elements that determine how well adversaries can do one of them is of course how clever it is does it have a strategy that's um, going to somehow crack whatever is going on but the other is just brute force how much running time does it have how many queries to the oracle and so forth we don't expect security when that running time and number of oracle queries get too high we already saw that with block ciphers you can recover keys if you're given enough time to run an exhaustive key search attack we expect rather or desire that if the running time and number of queries are at some practical level then the adversary shouldn't do too well and so that's what we mean by security so a function family f is secure in the prf sense if the advantage of an adversary is small no matter what is its strategy so for all adversaries but restricted to ones whose usage of resources stays within some practical bounds now this is not a mathematical definition the definition of the advantage itself is precise and mathematical this is not but that's kind of done on purpose and the reason is that security is subjective it's dependent on applications on on adversary resources and what we desire and we will use quantifications to kind of understand things better so this is kind of an operating rule of thumb as how to think of it 
Cryptographers often measure security in bits. For example, we may say this scheme or system or family of functions has 80-bit security. And effectively, what we mean by that is that if an adversary has running time 2 to the 80, it would possibly have advantage 1. If it has running time 2 to the 79, however, its advantage can't be more than a half. For running time 2 to the 78, not more than a quarter, and so forth. Usually, it's easier to think about and determine insecurity than security. So, when we have a particular family of functions, we would demonstrate insecurity in the PRF sense by giving a specific attack. That means we provide this adversary, some adversary, which we have to come up with, which may take some ingenuity, and we compute its advantage, and we show that it's quite close to one. And usually, we will do this with adversaries that use very little resources so as to make it quite obvious that it's a quite successful attack. But again, we'll quantify things more as we go along. Okay, so yeah, it will take maybe some going over these things to, to get them more clear. But um, an example would help too, so let's try that. So let's now take a particular family of functions. It has LBIT keys, LBIT inputs, and LBIT outputs. And it works simply by, on input a key k and, and LBIT string x, returning the XOR of k and x bitwise. So it's a very simple family of functions. And I'm going to ask, is it or is it not a secure PRF? What do you do when you get, get a question like that? You start putting on an attacker hat and you say, Okay, suppose I am thinking as an adversary. I'm an adversary, and I know what I have to do. I need to play these real and random games, but I won't be told ahead of time which one it is, and I have to um, figure that out and output a bit accordingly. My goal is to output a 1 when I'm playing the real game and a 0 when I'm playing the random game. More precisely, I want an, to design an adversary such that when I compute its advantage, the probability it returns one in the real game minus the same on the random game, it's high, which means close to one. And furthermore, the adversary should be very practical. It should use very little running time and very few queries. Once you know the setup, you start saying, OK, how can I approach this? Well, clearly, you have to find some weakness in this actual design. You look at the design and say, what is there in it that would enable me to uh, detect non-random behavior? What creates non-random behavior here, even if I don't know the key? Remember, the adversary here does not know the key. But nonetheless, seeing these outputs, it's going to see that there's some structure, some pattern. And you won't expect patterns over here. So what patterns come up? Well, here's something we observe. If I compute this function on two separate inputs and XOR the results, what happens? Well, I get, let's say the inputs are 0 and 1. I get k plus 0 and k plus 1. But then the k's go away, and I'm left with the sum of the inputs, which is 1. So the sum of two outputs is actually the sum of the corresponding inputs. That's quite a bit of structure. You don't expect something like that to happen for a function that's random. So that's the insight. Now we turn it into an actual attack. We specify the attack in pseudocode. And here's our adversary. Remember, this adversary has to play these formal games. These games give it an FN oracle, and it has to call that oracle. Remember, the adversary has no access to the key k. What does it do? It calls that oracle on 0, then on 1, so there are two queries in total. Whatever it gets back, it XORs together and sees if the result is 1. In other words, it simply tests what it expects to be true in the real world. And if that's true, it returns 1. And otherwise, it says, I, I think I'm not in the real world. OK. So now we have our ex an example of a completely specified adversary, and we see the forms that these take. 
they have to have a certain syntax. They call these oracles, um, they return a boolean, and so forth. Our next step is to compute its advantage. We remember the definition of the advantage is the difference between two probabilities, the probability of returning one in the real game and uh, in the random game. So let's compute those, address, those probabilities separately. Now, remember that the adversary is the same. We are fixing it. It's only the game that will change. With this fixed adversary, if it's playing this game, what is this probability of returning 1? How do we determine that? Well, we know when it returns 1. It returns 1 when the reply to this query plus the reply to this query is the string of 1s. What is the reply to this query? We look here. It's the hidden key plus 0. What is the reply to this? The same hidden key. Remember, the same key is used for all queries, plus 1. And as we saw before, you just get k plus k, um, uh, this application of the function is 0 plus of to 1, which is this due to the definition of the function, and you get back 1. So the test will trigger to true, and your adversary will return 1. This was true for all choices of this k, even though it was unknown, meaning it always happens. So the value of the probability is actually a 1. So very good, the adversary is always correct in identifying when it's playing the real game. But by itself, actually, that's not worth much. It could do that simply by making no queries and always returning one. So we need to look also at the other game. We now see here the other game, but the adversary has not changed. It's exactly the same code. I want to determine the probability that executing the same adversary with the random game results in an output of 1. So it happens under the same condition. The reply to the first query plus the reply to the second equals 1. The reply to the queries, however, is different. They are produced in this way. And as we see, the random game will return a random string in reply to each query, independently chosen each time. So our question then is simply, I have two random strings and I XOR them. What is the probability that you get back one as a, as a reply? And this will trigger a memory that we saw an example exactly like this, except that in that case, L was three and uh, the inputs may have been a little different, but it talked about making two queries on distinct inputs and seeing whether the XOR was a certain constant. You can look that up or do the calculation again. It's simple enough. And this probability is 1 in 2 to the L, because you have two random strings, and you have a, this constraint on them, and that leaves you with one dimension of freedom. We have both these numbers. We can put everything together. We compute the advantage of um, A in attacking F by subtracting those probabilities, and we get 1 in 2 to the minus L. Think of L as usually being quite large, so in cryptographic uh, application, we'd like L to be, you know, 64 or 128, 256, something like that. So in fact, this is very close to 1. Also, A is extremely efficient. Linear time, just two queries. Conclusion, the function family was extremely weak as a PRF. We were able to break it very easily. So that's not the way to go. Okay, so we have um, uh, illustrated now what PRFs are, and um, also seen um, how to use that in, um, uh, in assessing security. There are other examples for which you can uh, do that. Um, here's a, a, a family of functions that's based on AES, and you're asked to show that um, it's not a PRF. And here's another one kind of similar. This one is a little more interesting. Uh, remember that our adversary got an advantage of 1 minus 2 to the minus L. As L gets big, that gets extraordinarily close to 1, but it never actually hits 1. So one may ask, why can't I get an adversary with advantage exactly 1? It's, it does the best possible. And 
this exercise says you actually can can never do that. Your PRF advantage will always be slightly less than one. And this is an interesting thing to put.